This is Season 1, Episode 28, and you are listening to an After Dinner Conversation magazine podcast. After Dinner Conversation believes humanity is improved by ethics and morals grounded in philosophical truth, and that truth is discovered through intentional reflection and respectful debate. In order to facilitate this process, we've created a growing series of print books, a monthly short story magazine, and two different podcasts. This podcast, Philosophy Ethics Short Story Audiobooks, provides audiobook readings of stories that have appeared in our magazine. And our companion podcast, Philosophy Ethics Short Story Discussions, is where we discuss the ethics of the choices made in the stories as a way to model the kinds of discussions we hope you're having out there about these readings with friends, family, or students. We would love it if you'd go over and check it out as well. In fact, we discuss the ethics and decisions made in this very story in our companion podcast, After Dinner Conversation Discussions, in episode 50. So when you're all done listening to this audio podcast, head over to our companion podcast and listen to our discussion of this story. We will include a link in the description. And of course, you can always continue the discussion on our webpage and in the comment section or on our Facebook page. I'm Colby, your narrator, and the creator of After Dinner Conversation Publishing. Thank you for spending your time listening to our podcast and for reading the magazine. Thank you for supporting us through your magazine subscriptions and through patreon.com forward slash after dinner conversation. And of course, if you enjoy this audiobook reading, please subscribe to our podcast, share it on social media, and suggest it to friends. This week's story is by Doc Varga, and it is in the May 2021 magazine. The title of today's story is Pray. As I drove slowly towards the mob of angry protesters and my meeting with 200, I thought of 199, the ashes of a once hard man staring at me with wide eyes that pleaded for hope like a dog begging for treats. I'd somehow found a way to give him that hope, but I remembered the stench on him when he first came in. A man who had not bathed or changed clothes in who knew how long. Even when he did clean up halfway through our sessions, I could still smell the decay. And even after that final session, he left a waft of it clinging to the floor. My car purred almost soundlessly as it drove itself forwards, inching toward the chatting ranks of people and their placards. A cop who looked ready to fall asleep motioned me through the barricade as other officers stood at alert and kept the crowd parted. The picketers screamed their usual insults as me as I drove through them. Murder, bitch, slud, and worse. They had no idea who I was, I could have been any female employee, a janitor, a nurse, an office junior. They didn't care. They were hurting, and they wanted someone else to feel it. They didn't know how many lives I had saved. Maybe if I posted my save numbers on the car, I'd be greeted with less rancor. A scruffy young man with straggly blonde hair and a placard broke the police barricade. He threw his sign against my windshield and the car lurched to a halt, its collision-detecting screen flashing and beeping loudly. My body jerked against the safety belt. Justice for Jared, the sign screamed in daubed red letters before the cops dragged it and its bearer away. How clever. I finally got to my office 20 minutes later. It still smelled of 199, so I cleaned the chair and my desk with Lysol as I composed myself. I remember Jared, how could I not, seeing the protesters at the FLH gates twice a day. But he hadn't been one of my cases. He'd gone to Roger in the end, who was a distant second place in the race for top saver. Jared was 16 when he gave himself to LFH, which is what all the uproar was about. If he'd been two years older, none of these people would have cared, but he was subjected to all the protocols, all the tests, all the obstacles, and he went through with it anyway. Jared was broken in a way that most people couldn't fathom. He'd seemed ready to go the first time I saw him. 
Some people just aren't meant for the world, and it's a kindness to let them out in a way that helps humanity. It gives them purpose, even at their most hopeless. My office door opened, and the man I'd been thinking of as 200 walked in and broke me from my ruminations and my scrubbing. I took one look at him and thought, this'll be easy. I don't like it, but sometimes I feel just like that cocky, arrogant young girl who was top of her psych classes all through school and graduated valedictorian without really trying. He was young and lanky, held upright seemingly only by his dark, tight-fitting clothes. He smiled and limply shook my hand as I sat down at the desk. He sat opposite me with the transparent glass walls behind him. He glanced around nervously and stared at the lone painting on the only opaque wall behind me, which portrayed a woman walking across clouds. He was pale and pasty and his brown eyes were staring, but he was certainly handsome, perhaps in a way that the girls his age wouldn't appreciate. Five years from now, his picture would have all the ladies swiping right. This was a boy who was struggling, but once he found himself, he would thrive. He was a temp D, temporarily depressed, if I ever saw one. I would bet my life on it. Hi, Derek, I said. I'm Dr. Ainsley. Hi, he said, looking down at the desk. So, what brings you to LFH? He shrugged. Same thing everyone comes here for. And what is that, in your own words? To give up my life for a good cause. And what makes you want to give up your life when you're so young? He looked up. I could tell, even before he spoke, that he had rehearsed this part. I'm tired of living, he said. I'm ready to die, and I'd like it to be for the benefit of humanity. I've looked into your offerings, and I think I'd be best suited for gene therapy. Let me stop you for a moment. I seldom interrupt. The first thing they teach in training is to let the patient talk. But this was such a slam dunk, I wanted to get right to it. I'd like to start with why you're ready to die. Derek looked flustered. I... I don't know how to explain it. I'm just done living. Everything hurts all the time. What hurts specifically? My mind. My heart. There's no point to anything. Why try to deal with it when you can just be done with it? Well, I said carefully, there are a lot of good things in life, too. Is there anything you like? Not really. There must be something. He looked at his hands, working against each other on the surface of the desk. I like cats. I like cats, too. Do you have one? No, I still live with my parents. They won't let me have one. Have you considered getting your own place? I can't. Why not? I don't have any money. What if I could help you get a job so you could get your own place and get your own cat? Derek shrugged. I could help you with that. Think about it. Your own place. Your own cat. More than one if you wanted. Derek stared at me for a moment and shook his head. No, thank you. I was surprised by his outright and cool denial, but I persisted. Okay, but just out of curiosity, what would you name your cat if you had one? I'm not going to have one, so I'd rather not think of it. I sat back and examined him. There was an obstinance that seemed to transcend his frail body. This might even take a few sessions. I understand that, Derek, but to be approved for LFH... You need to be approved by an intervention counselor. That's me. Part of what I do is ensure that suicide is your only and final choice. And to do that, I need to work through scenarios with you. You don't have to approve anything. I just need to work with you for the mandatory 15 hours. And that was true. It was ultimately the individual's choice, but most didn't know that completely. I may not have the final say, but you are right about the hours. Please humor me. I'd rather not. Why? What's the harm? It just makes everything hurt more. Because you feel like if you died, you might miss out on something good? No, because I was never meant for that life. I wish I was, honest, but I'm just not. I sat forward again, leaned my elbows on the desk. You know, a lot of people feel like that. I did too once. Really? 
Yeah, when I was about your age, I was pretty lost. I had I had a couple of really bad experiences that I didn't think I could get over. Derek smiled, but I could tell it was fake. I'm glad you did get over them, he said. I am too. I hope you get over yours. Derek's smile melted into an even expression. I... It's not like that for me. Everything is a bad experience for me. You just told me you like cats. You must have had a good experience with cats at some point. Yeah, but no. Even good experiences are bad for me. They make me feel hollow and empty, like I don't deserve them. Why do you think you don't deserve them? I don't think anyone deserves anything. That's just how I feel. Well, why do you feel that way? I don't know. I just do. My head thinks things, but the way my body feels them is different. It's like I'm filled with tar. I know I just don't belong. Derek's cold calculation threw me, I'll admit. I hadn't been expecting him to have such a well-thought-out map of his feelings. But where were these feelings coming from? Derek, I said at length, I understand you have some conflict between what you think and what you feel. I'd like to explore that. I think the best way to do that is to investigate your past a bit. Do you mind if we start there? Sure, he said. For the next hour, I had Derek paint a picture of his life for me. He came from a regular home, and while I did see some signs of emotional disconnection with his family, there were no red flags indicating an abusive upbringing. In fact, much of what he told me was positive. By the time I was done, my initial arrogance was gone. I was still convinced there was no way Derek was going to go through with the process, but his steady, logical approach to taking his own life worried me. Those whose emotions were out of control often simply needed time and a choice to help them normalize. But the thinkers, they were the ones who went through with it in the end. Have you been sleeping well? I asked just before our session ended. On and off, Derek said. I reached into my drawer and pulled out a small container of Ambien. Sleep often helps us find clarity. He glanced at the pills. Oh, no thank you. Just take them. I can't make you do anything except attend our mandatory hours, but I'd appreciate it if you tried. Derek nodded. I'll try one tonight. Thank you, Derek. I'll see you in a couple of days. Thanks, Dr. Ainsley. I appreciate it. I walked Derek out of the office and into the lobby. I watched him as he went out the door to the parking lot. He showed no signs of distress. Typically, clients taking the first step towards life for humanity had strong emotional responses to their first sessions, and even if not expressed overtly, those emotions were usually apparent. Derek hid his well. Everything he'd said was well rehearsed, too. He knew the right things to say. The door behind me opened, and Sidney Gannett flashed a smile at me when I turned. Save 200? I set you up with a temp D after that last case. You've got two weeks to make your yearly bonus. Yeah, it should be easy, I said, though the words felt heavy and cursed coming out. Sidney was technically my boss, but he was an administrator and was wise enough to defer to the doctors on the front line. I knew I was one of his favorites, not because of my record, but because of our personalities gelling so well. We were both focused on opportunities rather than obstacles. Great. Just get him to sign that 703 form, and I'll approve it. Top saver four out of the last five years. Not bad, Dr. Ainsley. I smiled. I'll be happy when I get that check. I'll be happy when I write it. Want anything for lunch? Nah, I packed my own. I'll get you your reports by the end of the day. You're the best. He smiled and strode away down the corridor. I went back into my office and closed the door softly. Top saver four out of five years was pretty impressive. And even the one year I'd lost, I'd been near perfect. This year, no one was even close. I'd had 201 cases, not counting Derek, and I'd convinced all but two of them to reconsider ending their lives. Moreover, from what I could tell, most had gone on to thrive. The two who'd gone through with the process had been terminally ill and in the later stages of life. Their affairs were in order and their journeys had been supported by their families and loved ones. They were the ones this program was meant for. I didn't feel I failed them. Many 
of the saves had seemed like helpless cases. Save 199 had been the most difficult by far. It took all 15 intervention hours. He was a dad who'd watched his two sons, six and eight years old at the time, die when a compressor in his garage had exploded. His wife killed herself three days later by jumping off a roof. But after our 15 sessions, he'd found a reason to try and live at least another few years. There was always the risk he would do it on his own, but I had set him up with a grief counselor and got him a job as a manager for a failing charity project where he could put his business expertise to good use. Other applicants were over-medicated or highly erratic. Some were terminally ill, but with a reasonable lifespan left. Some were even calm and collected about their decision, like Eric. I had convinced them all that life was their best option. I loved saving lives. The hundred grand bonus for saving 200 in one year was nice, though, too. It was nearly lunchtime and I was hungry, but I caught a hallucinatory hint of the smell 199 had left in my office and my appetite disappeared. I focused instead on the report for the Marquis Colette case. If I got it done, maybe I could leave a little early. Marquis was one of the two terminally ill patients who had gone through with the program. In the end, he'd chosen to be subject for a medical trial investigating the lethality of components to a new drug that could potentially de-age the human body. I had been present at the procedure when his body was put into a comatose state as the researchers tested the effects of different doses of the compounds. It was quiet and went as planned. He survived for almost a week and the researchers gleaned a lot of good information from his case. I wrote about his noble sacrifice in the report to his surviving loved ones, and as part of continual grant applications to the government. Marquis' procedure was far more preferable to that chosen by the other terminal LFH donor. A former Marine in the final stages of lymphoma, he had volunteered to have a new weaponry tested on him, with a subsequent medical procedure to repair the damage inflicted by the laser-based firearm. His pain receptors were blocked, but it was messy. The procedure had indeed saved his life from the grievous injuries, but he was left without functioning limbs or mobility. So rather than test the weapon again, he was euthanized. While it was professionally and competently executed, one could only do so much to hide the horrors of blood and dismemberment. And I could only do so much to hide the memories from my mind. I got home around six, which was late considering how early I left, more delays caused by the protesters at the gates and around the outside of the LFH facility. I opened the door, and Shauna and Peter were waiting for me. Mama, they said in unison. Hey, my darlings, I said, scooping them in my arms. How was your day? Good, we learned about dinosaurs. Oh, yeah? Those are Daddy's favorites. Mark crept into the hallway like a stalking T-Rex. He put one leg up on the stair and roared. Yep, I said, still a child. Always, he said, and kissed my forehead. Dinner is almost ready. I caught a brontosaurus earlier. I ran upstairs to change. As I did, my eye got caught on the trophy case in my study. Plaques, degrees, jiu-jitsu medals, an award for my short-lived podcast, two jacked bros, and soon to be another top saver award, maybe even something special for 200. I still needed to close my last case, but I couldn't help my mind from wondering what was next. I caught my mind before it wandered too far and joined my family at the dinner table where the kids were already arguing over the size of their portions. Mama, Shauna said, Peter's eating all the potatoes. I need more than you because you're just a girl. Mama, Shauna wailed, tell him, Mama, Mama. Hun, Mark said, putting down his fork. You okay? Huh, I said and looked up. All three of them were looking at me. I just don't belong. That's what Derek had said. I just don't belong. That quiet confidence. I'm fine, I said, mentally shook myself, like a metaphorical wet dog. Peter, don't talk to your sister like that, and don't put so much on your plate. Shauna stuck her tongue out at him, and Mark smiled. Later, when the kids were in bed and I was doing the dishes, Mark stood by the sink and said, So I heard from a friend of a friend that you're going to make it. I smiled to myself. I think so. That's, that's incredible. Now, before you even start with additions, vacations, or how much to put in college savings, 
I need you to stop and stop with the dishes too. I put the plate down and turned around. I knew what he was going to say, but there was no way stopping him from saying it. Yes, Mark, what is it I can do with the money I've earned? You, my dear, are going to take a third of that bonus and spend it on yourself. Oh, am I? Yes, and you're going to travel, build an office, promote your book, go back to school. Blah, no more school. Mark laughed. Well, whatever you want, but it's going to be on you. Not the kids, not me. Well, maybe a little on me. And I suppose a little on the kids, but only after a third of it goes to something just for you. Ah, I have everything I need. Then get something you want. I have that too, to be honest. It's the record that's the most important thing. It means you saved a lot of lives. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry to say you're going to have to think about it. Then you can start on next year's record. I exhaled deeply to show my annoyance. I couldn't be mad. Mark always wanted what's best for me. He'd once had a trophy case as full as the one I kept in our bedroom, but it had gone into storage once we'd decided to start a family. He'd been as much of a winner as me, but he'd sacrificed his career to take care of the kids. He homeschooled them and kept the house in order so that I could do what I loved. And now he wanted me to be selfish with a bonus that was really half his. I suppose I could have done worse in my choice of husbands. I arrived early the next day because I was anxious about Derek, but ten minutes before his appointment, I got a message that he'd canceled. Applicants only had to do one thing to proceed through LFH, and that was to show up. If he canceled one more time, he would be thrown out of the program for a year, and I would hit 200. But he was my only case until the end of the year, and I had nothing else to do but paperwork. The day was long, and when I got home, the night was even longer. But I awoke early again the next day to see if Eric had gone for good. When I arrived at LFH, after being ushered through the protesters and barricades by the police, the offices were busy and my co-workers were wildly trying to close last-minute cases. I got word that Roger, who'd worked to save Jared, had quit. He'd had a mental breakdown after protesters followed him home and threw bricks through his windows. I called his cell phone, but I didn't get any response, nor did anyone answer at his home. The LFH team needed a win right now, and I felt that all eyes were on me to deliver it. I thrive on pressure, but sometimes it can feel like too much even for me. The phone rang and my heart jumped. Was it Derek calling to cancel? If so, it was all over, and I'd been fretting about nothing. I picked up the receiver. Dr. Ainsley. Hi, Dr. Ainsley. This is Derek. Hi, Derek. Sorry to have missed you yesterday. Yeah, I had some affairs I needed to attend to before this all went down, and I didn't want to wait until the end. I hesitated. Well, we're scheduled for today, too. If you miss another session, you have to wait until next year. Oh, I'll be there today. I just wanted to call and let you know I was I was coming. Thank you for letting me know, Derek. I'll see you soon. Damn, I thought as my worry returned. I shook my head hard. Nothing I could do about it. And who knew, maybe he wouldn't even show up. I didn't have him figured out yet. The day wore on and I continued to hope I wouldn't see him. But he arrived 15 minutes early and sat in the waiting room with a book. He could see me through the transparent walls of my office, and I tried to look busy shuffling through papers like a new hire on the clock at four on a Friday. I could have made him wait. I should have made him wait. But as soon as he arrived, the smell was back. I hadn't noticed it for two days, but as I sat there waiting for him, it was moist and heavy in the air. I sent for him at ten before two. His clothes were nearly identical to last time, a black denim jacket, dark green slacks, and a plain black t-shirt, though that at least had been changed. He sat down and looked at the floor. Knives did circles in my stomach. Hi, Derek. How are you feeling? Good. Any thoughts since we last spoke? He shook his head. No, not really. What affairs kept you away yesterday? Derek was happy to talk about the mundane matters of ending his life. He talked about his will and the lawyer he'd hired who twitched his nose every time he disagreed with Derek, and double-blinked his left eye whenever he started to read. He told me about going to the library to donate all his books, but taking out a new one to pass the time over the last few weeks. I knew he was stalling, 
but I learned how observant he was and how he viewed other people, so I let him continue. It was only when he began recounting his tax affairs that I stopped him. What was the book you borrowed from the library? He shrugged and looked almost embarrassed. Just some history stuff about World War II. Do you like history? Sometimes. I really like World War II stuff, I guess. Why is that? It was just cool. I mean, it was terrible, his face flushed, but there was a clear right and wrong, a villain. Usually bad stuff is more subtle. But even though someone has a little bad in them, Hitler had way more. So it was easy to know who to root for. Is that what you believe, that everyone has a little bad in them? Derek shook his head. No, I believe bad is a construct. We just think things are bad because we are afraid to die. I leaned in closer. Please elaborate. Derek gave me a look that said the answer was obvious. Well, he said, as if explaining to a slow-witted child, isn't it funny how things are so terrible in the moment, but after time they seem okay, like in World War II, when those people died, it was so awful. But now we can study them and even make jokes about them, and it's okay. I'm not sure I follow. If you saw a cat die, especially one you liked, it would be terrible, right? Yes, it would. But if you saw a skeleton of a cat from long ago, you wouldn't feel so bad, even if it died terribly. I suppose that's because it happened a long time ago. That's kind of how I think it all should feel. I think in the moment, everything hurts a lot because we're afraid to die. But once it's there and we accept it, it's really okay. We might be a little sad because we miss life, but it's all okay. And do you think you'll miss life when it's gone? No, I don't think anyone does. What about those still alive? Will any of them miss you? They might, but I won't know it. I'm just saying in time, no one will mind. Your family will. It will be very hard for them. Maybe, but even they will die one day, and then it'll be all forgotten. So you saying you believe nothing matters? It does matter. It just doesn't mean what we think it means. I stared back at him and waited until he broke it down more. I just think a lot of our feelings are because we are afraid to die, he repeated. If we weren't so afraid, none of it would hurt that much. I don't totally disagree with you, I said after a long pause, but I think by devaluing the impact of death, you might be devaluing the importance of life. I think it's built into us to want to feel important. I'm not saying we aren't, but like our fear of death, self-importance, it's just a survival mechanism. Jared knew that. What? I said and sat up. Jared. Derek looked nervous, as if he'd said something wrong. Jared, the kid they're protesting about, he knew that. Did you know Jared, I asked, and I suddenly didn't recognize the ice in my own voice. No, not personally, but I just know he knew the same thing. Jared again. What did Derek and the angry mobs of young protesters know about Jared anyway? They certainly didn't know that Jared would have killed himself one way or another, whatever happened. The boy suffered a torment none of the people in those crowds would ever understand. At least Roger and the rest of the team had tried to keep Jared alive. What had that not-so-silent minority done for him? And never mind the countless others who would have blown their brains out or slit their wrists in the tub if not given a chance to go through the LFH program. At least half of this year's 199 saves would have attempted suicide at some point, but going through the process changes them and gives them perspective. And the ones that really want to do it, well... They help humanity solve problems that would otherwise be insoluble. It seems to me that you think you know a lot more than you actually do. Derek's blush deepened and he looked down. I hadn't meant to be so harsh, but thinking about what the whole Jared thing had done to Roger made me hot. I took a deep breath and spoke slowly. Okay, so if you think our feelings in the moment confuse our judgment, isn't it possible that your feelings about not enjoying life are interfering with your willingness to survive? Yes, but I don't think they are. If death is permanent and inevitable, why not just live it out and see what happens, at least more than 20 years? Derek seemed to draw his body tightly inward, but he kept his eyes on me. It's hard to explain. 
We have 14 hours left, Derek. We have plenty of time. I don't think you'll get it. I've worked with thousands of people in your position. I've heard a lot. For a moment, he looked as though he was going to open up, but the tension melted from his face and he relaxed into his chair. I'm tired of being prey. Is someone hurting you? I had asked him this question before, and I was satisfied with the answer and background check we'd done, but it needed to be asked again. Not in the way you're asking. How then, and who? A predator. Who, Derek? Your parents? A co-worker? She's bigger than them. She? Yeah, um, time's up, Dr. Ainsley. Can we talk about this tomorrow? No, Derek, I want to talk about this now. If someone is hurting you, I need to know. Not like that, Dr. Ainsley. It's not a person. Then what is it? It's just me. I'm sorry I gave the wrong impression. There's no one hurting me. I need you to look me in the eyes and say that. Derek looked at me. He was clearly afraid. I'm not being abused by anyone. Can I go? I made him sit with it for a moment. Finally, I said, you may. Derek stood up and turned to leave, but I called. Wait, Derek. Yes? Do you smell anything? He sniffed the air. No, smells like nothing. Okay, thank you. See you tomorrow. Derek nodded and left quickly without a goodbye. I needed to get to the bottom of this apparent trauma. Subsequent sessions did not unravel any more of the mystery. Derek became even quieter. It was like I'd stumbled upon a dark secret and he was too embarrassed to face me. I was patient, dancing around the subject rather than cutting to the heart of it, but he offered nothing. By the time his fifth session was over, I'd found so little evidence of outside abuse that I began to think he'd made it up. Perhaps he was trying to justify what he wanted to do. On my way out that day, I called into Sydney's office and dropped off a handful of files. I think I'm going to need a 2204. Really? Sydney said. Yeah, it's a tougher case than I'd expected. It's only been a handful of sessions. You'll be fine. I smiled. Just getting the paperwork rolling in case I'm not. You won't need it, Sydney said, but I'll file it anyway. Thank you, I said. I started chewing at my thumbnail and surreptitiously moved my hand away from my mouth. I hadn't bitten my nails in years, though I'd chewed them to the quick all through college. I'd sailed through classes with no sweat, but I'd had other sources of stress and anxiety, ones I refused to let myself think about anymore. I thrust my hands in my pockets and glanced at Sydney. He hadn't even noticed. Much later that night, after the kids and my husband were in bed, I pulled out my laptop and began scrutinizing Derek's online persona. I usually put my faith in clinical documents, but I was bloodying my knuckles against a wall, and I needed some sign of a crack. His media platforms were private, and all I could see were a couple of pictures of Derek looking happy. Instagram, Facebook, and Tumblr were all the same. I googled his name and found nothing of note until the second page, where I saw an advertisement for a writing contest Derek had won, with a piece called Predator. It was published in full on the contest's website, so I opened it and read it through. Once, a long time ago, there was a whole meadow of plants and animals, rabbits and turtles, squirrels and foxes, bears and wolves. They were all happy and connected. The sunlight in the meadow provided them with all the energy they needed to survive and explore. They were content. Until the predator came. He was innocent at first, he took the form of a cave, promising the answers to great mysteries for those brave enough to enter. For a long while, the creatures in the meadow ignored the cave, politely insisting that there were no mysteries. But as time passed, a spark that began as wonder mutated into temptation. It took a long time, longer than any of the animals could remember, but eventually a small rabbit gave in. As the rabbit approached, the cave asked, why are you not as big as the bear, or as calm as the leaves? Because I am quick, like a rabbit, the rabbit replied. Why are you not the quickest and the strongest and the calmest? It's just the way things are. But is it the way things have to be, said the cave. 
Of course. Of course, the cave snorted with a laugh. The bunny almost turned to go, and the cave would have let it. Do you know something I do not? The rabbit asked. There it was, envy. I've been telling you all for centuries that I do, the cave said, but no one will enter and find out. The bunny looked deep into the cave, his nose and whiskers twitched fervently. If I enter, can I return? I don't believe you'll want to. The bunny didn't like the answer, but the hooks were in too deep. He approached the cave and disappeared into its mouth. When his friends came looking for him, the cave told them where he had gone. He told them that there were no limitations where their friend was. He would not return because, in his new universe, he could aspire to be quick, strong, and poised. The creatures of the meadow became alarmed because the cave did not worry. Once the first fell, the rest would succumb. It had happened before, and it would happen again. Soon, a tiny bird showed up chirping about its lack of excellence. The cave opened its mouth wide to let it see the small rabbit, bounding with speed and strength, smiling and laughing. The bird watched for a moment, said nothing, then hopped in. Others followed, butterflies, foxes, and bears, all wanting a chance of becoming more than they were when they entered. They all disappeared until only a lone wolf remained in the empty meadow. You have deceived them well, it said to the cave. It was not so difficult. You are a predator and a parasite. I am, and my stomach is full. You will not last forever. You will stretch thin and your walls will break. We are eternal. You are not. That may be so, but for now, I am satisfied. The lone wolf dropped his head and sauntered into the cave's mouth. Then I will join my family in hell until you break. The cave chortled, and the wolf took one last look back at the meadow before the cave slammed its mouth shut tight. Predator, I whispered to myself in the dark. The next day, Derek arrived precisely on time. He looked more confident and sure. He held his head high and even more steady eye contact with me until I spoke. Tell me about the cave. Derek's eyes widened. The story you wrote, Predator. You spoke about a predator that lured animals inside it. Derek's shoulders finally relaxed. You did some digging. Yes. It's just a story, Dr. Ainsley. I know, but stories, no matter how seemingly disconnected, always tie back to the author. It's just an idea I had. I believe that, but the word predator, it's the same word you used the other day. I don't like predators. We are predators. Even if you're vegetarian, plants are still alive. We take their energy. Derek nodded. That's part of the reason I want to die. I don't want to take anyone else's life force. Energy is borrowed, Derek. Nothing keeps it forever. What if it's not supposed to be that way? What if we aren't supposed to compete for it? We can't change that. It's the way things are. I know, but what if we can't see everything? We most certainly can't. Do you see something I do not? Yes. I, I mean, no. I sat forward. Who's the predator, Derek? He started glancing around the room again, avoiding eye contact. His hands worked against one another. I had to fight the urge to start chewing on my thumbnail. Who's the predator? I asked again. I can't tell you. Why? What does it matter? If you're going through with this. Because I'm going through with it for a reason. And that whole reason is ruined if I tell you. I don't understand. I know you don't. You can't possibly. Help me try. She won't allow it. It'll be all for nothing. It's a woman. No. Derek, give me something. He stood up abruptly. I've got to go. If you do, the process is over. You'll need to wait a year to reapply. Listen, I can't tell you any more. His voice was angry and desperate. He looked like a cornered animal. You have to answer my questions. It's mandated. No, I have to engage in conversation with you. 
I can't just sit here, but I don't have to answer all of your questions. That's your interpretation of the guidelines. No, that's what the guidelines say. Derek, I'm trying to help you. Believe me, if dying is the best possible outcome for you, I'll help you go through with it. But please, just be open to other possibilities. That's what she wants us to think about. Possibilities. There's only one choice, Doctor. What's wrong with possibilities? They are distraction from the truth. It's the possibilities in life that keep us from seeing the truth, hoping we can become better than we are, and we end up lost. I've seen the truth, and I can't run from it. What's the truth, Derek? She wouldn't like it if I told you. You wouldn't like it either. I felt the wheels spinning in the mud. I was pressing too hard, but my face was burning, and inexplicably, I felt like crying. Though whether in frustration, pity, or rage, I couldn't say. I could sense Derek's life slipping through my fingers, and the harder I tried to grab it, the less grip I had. I exhaled deeply. Okay, Derek, let's change topics. He sat back down, but he was still and stiff as a length of planking. Have you taken those pills to get some sleep? Yes, they, they helped. I wasn't sure I believed him, but I could only take his word. Here's what I want you to do for me, I said. I'm going to let you go early if you do something. Sure, he said eagerly. I want you to go home and clean your room. I keep it pretty clean. I want you to deep clean it. Everything. The drawers, the sheets, under the bed. Then I want you to clean your car, scrub every corner of every surface you own. If you do that and bring me pictures in with you on Monday, I'll count that as an extra session. So I do that, and I'll need one less session to proceed? Yep. That's going to take a long time. Can it count as two? No, this isn't a negotiation. It's an offer. Take it or leave it. Derek nodded. I'll take it. I'll see you on Monday. Monday it is. When he was gone, I waited ten minutes before going to see Sydney. I'm leaving early, and I need that 2204 set up for Monday. Sydney laughed. Where are the papers? I turned them in yesterday. I mean the clearance papers. The way he walked out of here today, his head high and smiling. You got him to wave, right? I felt my face tighten. I need the 2204 on Monday. Sydney leaned back. You're serious? Yes, Sydney, I'm serious. I'll be in early Monday to arrange things. I left his office and walked away, but he chased me down. Wait up, what happened? I closed my eyes and held up my hands. Sydney, please. I just need you to set up the 2204. Just tell me. I need to go home, Sydney. I couldn't catch the anger before it left my mouth. Sydney stopped following me, though. Okay, he said to my back as I walked out the door. I'll get it set up. I spent the weekend switching off from work. I went to the park with Mark and the kids, and we spent Sunday catching up on their homework. I spent a lot of time cleaning. Mark was great at running the household, but his eye for grime was not as keen as mine. At least he knew better than to try and stop me. I needed it to keep me occupied. I tried not to think about Derek until Sunday night, after both the children had gone to bed and it was just Mark and I watching TV. You know, I said, when I was a kid, I had this funny little voice inside me that told me I wasn't good enough. Mark sat up and adjusted his glasses before looking at me. I think a lot of people have that. No, it was a real, actual voice, not just self-doubt. It was a thing. I still remember what it sounded like. Your imagination's pretty spectacular. I know. I took that doubt that everyone feels, and I made it a real monster. Something I could see and fear because I didn't know how to see or fear doubt. It lasted all through college. Schoolwork and classes never bothered me, but that little voice, it terrified me. Really, it made my life hell for a long time. I stared at the TV for a while. I think the case I'm working on is doing the same thing, but I'm not sure. He sat up fully. Mark and I used to be more intimate. I couldn't imagine my life without him, but we had stopped growing closer a while ago. It was almost as if we became so close we bounced off one another. When we had kids, he went their way and I continued trying to be a success. 
As such, I rarely spoke to him about cases, despite his obvious curiosity, so I had his full attention. What's he or she seeing? A predator, he calls it. I thought it was something in his life abusing him, but now I think it's something he made up, like I did. Well, how do you find out for sure? I send him to the edge. I arrived early the next morning to prep for the 2204. There was a ton of paperwork involved, and it was expensive. It required extensive staff, lots of setup, and too many resources for it to be a regular occurrence, but I was a senior staff member. If I said I needed it, I did. Sidney had taken my request seriously, so it wasn't too difficult to get everything in order. I could tell he was worried just from the way he looked at me, and I couldn't argue that he wasn't right to be. This case was making me deeply uneasy, and I just wanted to be done with it. Derek arrived on time. He looked happy, or at least confident. He sat down in the chair across from me. I did as you asked, he said. Everything? The car, too? Derek punched some buttons on his phone and flipped it around towards me. Scroll through. I swiped through a few before and after pictures, examining them carefully. His room looked nearly empty. There were no pictures on the wall, only a couple of collector's toys on a neatly organized desk. You don't have any pictures on your walls? Derek frowned. I do. It's on the wall behind me. It's a big kitten with a bionic arm. The room, though, it's the cleanest it's ever been. I scrubbed every corner. Is that the only picture you have? No other decorations? No, I like to keep things clean. Too much clutter makes me uncomfortable. I nodded and handed the phone back. And how did cleaning make you feel? Good, Derek said and blinked at me. Did I do it well enough to skip a session? You did. Thank you. Cleaning is a tactic used by LFH prevention psychologists to help people reassess and reset their lives. Many times that is enough all by itself to deter a person and persuade them to give life one more shot. But Derek was a tough case. I knew it wouldn't be that easy. Did it change anything about your intentions, I said. He shook his head slowly. No, doctor, I still want to go through with this. I stood up so suddenly it made Derek jump. In that case, I said, I've been instructed to skip the rest of the sessions. Are your affairs in order? What, he said, shrinking in his chair. We will go right now. The molecule mixing branch has urgent need for a volunteer. It'll be quick and painless. But I wanted gene therapy. There's a month wait for that. But I want to help humanity. The molecule mixing branch is the most advanced, coveted program we have. They are working on transportation technology that will change the science, medical, commercial, and even social industries forever. There is no better option. I just thought gene therapy could be painful, and I think I can take it. This is far more important, or we could wait and finish our sessions. No, Derek said and jumped up. I'll do it. Follow me, I said. We walked out into the hallway, and I took him through processing. There was about an hour's worth of final paperwork to fill out, followed by a final re-examination with another prevention psychologist, where he was asked again if he would like to proceed. Derek said he would. I took him to the transport and sat him in the back of the car that took us to the actual LFH testing facility. There were three others scheduled for departure that day, and one had already been carried out. The entire complex had glass walls for complete transparency. The molecular testing facility was at the far end of the building, so we had to march past the other experimental environments. Derek looked in on them. For the first time since last week, I saw weakness in him as he passed the gene therapy lab. Deep in there, we glimpsed the body of the second departure convulsing on a gurney, which seemed to pass to Derek's face, causing his eyes to twitch in water. It was a long march, and by the time we were finally there, Derek looked unsteady on his legs. The head researcher asked him to enter a private room and change his clothes. He was in there for a long while, and for a moment I thought he might have caved, but he hadn't. He emerged, still uneven, but his eyes forward. For 20 minutes, the researchers explained the process and the information they would gather from the experiment. Derek was asked to sign papers and give verbal confirmation after every line. 
indicating that he was coherent of right mind and understood his responsibilities. He did so without hesitation. When the instructions were finished, I was asked to come forward. I can accompany you in, if you'd like, I said. Yes, Derek replied. I'd like that. He was shaking. I was asked to put on protective gear and walked into the molecular chamber with another scientist, whose face was obscured by a protective mask. The chamber was massive but empty. A giant sphere was suspended under the glass floor, and a tiny spire hung down from the ceiling. There was a red circle that read danger, cordoning off the center of the chamber. A yellow line encircled the red one, and I walked up to Derek, who stood at its edge. This is it, Derek, I said. It's all happening so fast, he said. His teeth were virtually chattering. Are you sure this is what you want? He mumbled something. He was going to turn back. I was sure of it. You may step to the red line when ready, the researcher said. Derek froze. He stared ahead at the red line. Where his arms had been shaking moments ago, they were now still and dripping with sweat. Time to give him a push. This is what you wanted, I said. Now or never. I thought I saw his feet turn. I swear I did. I thought I saw him turn to walk out of the room and live a full and happy life after staring into the abyss. But he stepped forward, up to the red line. A breeze moved through the chamber as the molecular mixer whirled into motion. The sphere below the floor started to spin slowly, though it was so smooth and white it was hard to perceive. Electricity cracked in the air, and I felt whisks of my hair begin to dance and float. Despite what I knew, my heart started to race. Derek looked straight ahead as a dull roar echoed through the chamber. He had to turn back now. His predator was a figment, like my growling voice of doubt and fear. It wasn't real. It was time to face that and return to life. Turn back, I willed. Derek turned around to face me and my heart leapt, but he smiled in mouth words. I could interpret, but not hear. Thank you, doctor. With that, he turned back toward the center of the chamber and stepped forward. A deafening horn blared out and Derek crumpled into a ball in the center of the chamber before everything shut down. Fuck, I thought. The lights went off and then came back on again. Derek was lying in the fetal position on the floor. Violent tremors racked his body. I could smell urine and excrement. When he finally opened his eyes, he looked around the room, confused. What happened? I didn't say anything. I just stared back at him until he came to the realization on his own. You... you bitch, he said as the fake researchers helped him to his feet. I watched them pick him up and escort him out of the chamber. With every step, he became more irate. Fuck you, he yelled. Fuck you, you stupid. The door closed, and I stood alone in the fake research lab. Two hours later, I entered my office back in the main building, where Derek already sat. His rage hadn't faded, but it had settled, like cement weighing him down in his chair. His breathing was regular but shallow, and I could almost hear his teeth grind. This was only the second time a 2204 had failed me. Did you know, I asked? Did I know what, Derek said without looking at me? That it wasn't real. Did it look like it? I walked around to the chair across from him and sat. No, but you hide things well, Derek. You're an asshole. You know why we did it. You thought I'd change my mind. Well, I haven't. I had to give you your best chance. Next time, it will be real. Is the molecular transportation thing even real? No. It's for 2204s. That's what you call it. It's fucking batshit. You're all fucking heartless assholes. I took a deep breath. I understand you're angry, but you're smart. You must have had your doubts. He looked up at me, his brow furrowed, his eyes trembling. I had no fucking clue. Come on, Derek. You thought we'd just rush you through like that? I didn't have time to think. I think you knew from the second I offered. Derek smiled. Maybe that's what you hope, what you want to believe. It's the truth, he laughed out loud. You're the one who needs a shrink. We all do sometimes. Either way, we'll find out soon. 
As part of 2204 parameters, you are required to have only one more session before you make your final decision. Another trick? No. It's thought that if you're willing to jump once and not regret it, you have the right to make your final call. Tomorrow will be our last session. If you choose to go through with it, gene therapy has an opening at the end of the week. You can be done as early as Friday. Why should I? You'll be given a full rundown with my manager. It's not a trick. Derek studied me and then rolled his head around. Fine. Can I go? You can. He stood up and walked quickly to the door, but he froze when he reached it. You want to know who the predator is, Dr. Ainsley? Yes. I didn't want you to know. I wanted to spare you, but you know what? Fuck you. I want you to feel like I do. I instinctively rubbed my palms together. They were sweaty. I chewed at my thumbnail and had torn a sliver of it away with my teeth before I even realized what I was doing. Tell me, I said. You're standing on it. What? Earth. She's the predator. I don't understand. We are not our body's doctor. We are energy. We are eternal. And she's trapped us in life, destined to cycle over and over again, feeding her never-ending appetite. And what makes you think that? I'll tell you all about it, he said, turning away. Tomorrow. He slipped out of the office, and when the door closed behind him, the smell of 199 was thick and putrid. I stormed out of the janitor's closet and pulled out all the Lysol, bleach, and rags I could carry. I took them to my office and began to scrub. Every surface, every nook, every crack in my white room. Harlan, one of the janitors, knocked on the door and asked if he could help, but I sent him away. I dug, scraped, and scoured until my arms were so exhausted that I could barely raise them. When I was done, I basked in the stink of chemicals for a while before making my way home. When Derek arrived the next morning, we just stared at one another for more than a minute. I don't know where to start, I admitted. We're far past the start, doctor. I nodded. Where did you get the idea of Earth being a predator? A good friend of mine told me. Which good friend? One I haven't mentioned. Where did you meet this friend? Online, in a game. In a game? What game? It's called Mysteria. It's pretty old. One of those online community things. Just about the only one my computer can still play. Everyone used to play it, but there's barely anyone now. Okay, and who did you meet there? He was a paladin. I couldn't even read his level, it was so high. Past 999, and the box only holds three numbers because they never thought anyone would get that high. And he told you the Earth was a predator. What made you believe him? I didn't believe him until he showed me. And then it all made sense. What did he show you? His YouTube channel. He's got hundreds of videos up. I'd show you everything on it, but it's password protected and he changes it every few weeks. And what does he say in these videos? All kinds of things, like, think about our bodies. They're just bags of meat and water. They shouldn't work, but they do. Some might call that grace. But that's what she wants us to think while she's trapped our essence and feeds on our energy. We think we're blessed. We think we are born and we think we have to struggle to survive when all we have to do is die. How can you be so sure? Once you see, you can't unsee, doctor. Our attachments, our family, our friends. She uses those to keep us alive, to keep us going. So you think attachments are fake? Attachments aren't real. They are all a survival mechanism. Even if they are survival mechanisms, they're still real. It's all chemicals mixing in our heads, telling us we have to do this to survive. Without those, why would we want to survive so bad? Because that's what life is sometimes. Maybe all the time. Surviving. What if we just stopped? Humanity would become extinct. And is that so bad? I studied him to slow the conversation. In the grand scheme of the universe, maybe not, but for us it would be devastating. Our bodies are not all we have, he said. You believe in a soul? Of course. She's the one who doesn't want us to believe that. She's the one who wants us to hold on to our bodies, 
like they're all we have. I stood up and walked around the room. And this fantasy is why you want to die? It's not a fantasy. It is, Derek. You have no evidence. It makes sense. Based on your very limited knowledge of the world, and you're willing to risk everything for it, he stared at me with unflinching eyes. Yes, doctor. Then why go through all this? Why LFH? Fear glazed his eyes almost immediately. He whispered, Because our only chance is to destroy Earth, to end humanity in one go. But we can't. She's too powerful. Environmentalists would disagree. She's not afraid. The Earth will persist. She's more afraid we will hurt ourselves and take away her food. She doesn't want to hunt again. That's why I'm doing it this way. That's why I don't just end things. She would just suck me back up. But she knows I know, and I'm sharing it with you, and that makes her afraid that we might find the truth. You think the earth is afraid of you? I can cause her problems, and if I give my life to further humanity, to further her cause, to make her food live on, then maybe. His face flushed, and he looked back at the floor. Maybe she will let me go. He moved beyond the realms of modern human thought. Had I discovered this earlier, we could have worked through it, but it was too much to unpack in one session. Derek, let's take some time with this. We need more sessions. No, he cried and stood up. It's time. I did what I needed to do. Derek, please. No, I'm done listening. I did everything you asked. It's my right to die how I want. He wouldn't go through with it. It was a story he'd created to make sense of his pain. He knew the 2204 was fake, and he wanted to play this out until the end. I went to my desk and pulled out some forms. Fill these out, I said. I have you scheduled for Friday. Derek pulled up his chair and read each form carefully while filling out the required information. When he was done, I let him go. He wouldn't do it. I knew people who wanted to die, and Derek was not one of them. When Friday arrived, I was waiting in the LFH labs. Derek looked nervous, more nervous than during the 2204. We made our way to the gene therapy branch with an entourage of scientists and lawyers. When we arrived, Derek had to go through a last bout of paperwork before it was time for the process to begin. He was ushered into a chamber, and I walked by his side. It was an empty space except for a table in the middle of the room and three metal tubes that led to a panel in the one non-transparent wall. One of the metal tubes sprouted a dozen or so smaller clear tubes, which would administer the chemicals needed for the study. The thickest of these led to a six-inch needle under the headrest of the chair. The syringe was built to penetrate the brainstem and administer a lethal injection that would end Derek's life in an instant. Inside, Derek was strapped to a table. The accompanying researcher explained that the process was painful and asked if Derek was sure he wanted to proceed. Derek nodded, though his face was slick with sweat. The researcher explained that there would be a single injection, that the entire process would last about 12 minutes. The discomfort would start small, but would eventually grow. Once the process was started, there was no turning back. He was given a safety word, rabbit. If he said it out loud three times, they would terminate the experiment and euthanize him. However, the project would only provide results if it lasted the entire duration. As the researcher went to prepare the injection, I was left alone with Derek. I too was sweating and shaking, and my eyes were full of tears. I wanted to ask him to turn back, but I knew where that would get me. Mittens, he said. What? I asked. That's what I would have named my cat. It's boring, but I like it. I didn't answer. I couldn't, even if I had wanted to. The researcher returned, and I was escorted out. I joined the audience in the next chamber and watched through the window as the researcher held up the syringe for the cameras. I held my breath as Derek mouthed something. I prayed for it to stop, but the researcher only nodded before bending down and plugging the needle into Derek's arm. Derek immediately tensed, and the researcher left him alone in the chamber. I can't see, he said, and his body relaxed. 
but after a minute, his muscles tensed again and his body strained against the restraints. A minute later, he began to whimper. A minute after that, he began to scream. Five minutes in, he was thrashing against the table, begging and pleading, I made myself watch. I made myself suffer with him. My mouth was full of fingernails. Seven minutes in, his skin was pallid and wrinkled, shiny with sweat. Blood started to ooze from his eyes and nose. Rabbit, he screamed. Stop it, I said. A hand held me back. He has to say it three times. And possibly another minute passed as his mouth frothed and his head thrashed wildly. He was trying to speak, but only gurgles came out. Shut it down, I said. We're ten minutes in, the voice behind me said. Two to go, or it was all a waste. I put my hands on the glass and tried to reach out to him with my mind or my soul. His head lulled towards me and I saw his lips. Rabbit, 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 he mouthed. Shut it down, I shouted. The researcher tried to hold me back, but I threw my fist and struck him in the eye. It felt like I'd broken my hand. Two arms grabbed me from behind. He's saying it, I screamed. Confirmed, I heard another voice say. A loud red buzzer sounded and Derek went still. What the fuck, the researcher holding me said. Safe word on audio confirmed, said the technician at the desk. Fuck, another researcher said. A minute and thirty seconds away. Fuck. I threw the man holding me aside and stumbled into the corridor. I staggered outside and into the parking lot while I opened my car and got in. I locked it and put the screen shades on full block. I cried uncontrollably, then slept, and for who knows how long. But when I woke, it was dark. I found my way home eventually and told Mark I needed a weekend away. I didn't go far, just to the nearest hotel, where I sat on the bed and ordered food for two days. I went straight to work on Monday, trying to pretend it was all a bad dream. There were stairs as I passed through the building. I found solace in my office. The room still smelled like cleaning chemicals. I closed the doors and moved my desk to face the wall so that those on the outside of the glass could not see my face. I pulled out a stack of paperwork and began to complete it. Sidney knocked on the door around lunchtime. He'd given me all the space I'd needed that morning, but he still felt like an intruder. Hey, Dr. Ainsley, he said from behind me. You okay? Yeah, just facing the wall so I don't get distracted. Always diligent. I heard it was a tough one on Friday. I nodded, still not facing him. It's what he wanted. I did my best. You did, and I have some good news for you. His cheeriness made me want to hit him. I waited, but his paws insisted that I turn around. I spun around slowly to face him working hard to keep the smile on my face. Yeah, I said, with as much enthusiasm as I could fake. Yep, Sydney was beaming. I wanted to vomit. I spoke to the board, and you're getting your 200 bonus. I... But I didn't get to 200. Listen, this last case was a tough one. It wasn't your fault. I know you did everything you could. No, Sydney, I fucked up. I called the 2204 too early. I, I didn't... Your job is to keep people who truly want to live from ending their lives. But some people just don't want to move on. That's not your fault. That's not the point. Sidney shrugged. Maybe not. But after that whole fiasco with Jared Dunn, the LFH needs a win. And I'm convincing them that promoting your 200th save this year is the best way to do it. And fortunately for you, that comes with a big paycheck. I don't deserve it. You do. What's the difference between 199 and 200 anyway? I thought of Derek's face, bloody and frothing. There was a difference, all right. Oh, yes, there was a difference. When I got home later that evening, my husband, children, and extended family surprised me with a party. There was even a cake which read, A Celebration of Life. I wondered whether that was something to be celebrated anymore. Derek hadn't thought so. I stood in front of that cake and looked down at my feet on the floor and the earth beneath it. For the first time, the safety of the ground seemed sinister, like I was being pulled and peeled against my will, my life being sucked through my feet into a parasitic core. And all around me were blind fools. 
I could smell the ignorance on them, these people I was supposed to love, but who were no more important to my soul than the body I inhabited. I wanted to get away, but where could I go where the vileness would not follow? When I was trapped on the earth, there seemed to be no escape, no way out. I heard the voice of my childhood again. Lies, my oldest companion whispered. And then I thought of Derek's face, bloody and frothing. The End Discussion Questions Question number one. Do you think people have the right to commit suicide? What, if any, are the legitimate versus illegitimate reasons to commit suicide and why? Number two. Is Derek's reason to die a good enough reason? Why or why not? Number three. Does the potential truth or falsity of Derek's reason for wanting to die change his right to die? Is the validity of his reason relevant to his right to die? Question number four. Was Dr. Ainsley right to order the 2204? Are tricks in this instance wrong? If so, why or why not? And number five. If you knew a secret that you believed was truth, like Derek, and that you believed would cause other people to want to consider committing suicide, would you keep that truth a secret? If you enjoyed this story, head over to our companion podcast, After Dinner Conversation Discussions, Episode 50, and listen to our discussion of this and other stories from our magazine. We'll include a link in the description. And of course, you can always continue the discussion on our webpage in the comments section or on our Facebook page. Have a wonderful day. Next week's story is A Wolf on the Bus. Have a great day.